Well, so someone promised quite a lot there. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. I know you have a choice of talks to go to. So thank you very much. And also thanks for sticking. I know uh, sticking with PyData for two full days of talks. Uh, it will not be too mathematical, hopefully, for Sunday afternoon. Uh, so I went on the internet this week, and I found this. Uh, now, I'm not going to be talking about this type AI for energy. I'm going to actually be talking about fairly uh, um, implementation. Uh, I'm going to talk about implementation. I'm going to be talking about uh, the specific tools that we use. Uh, so this is not going to be a marketing slide about, uh, or a marketing deck about how we are going to revolutionize everything with AI. Uh, now, why is machine learning important in particular in this energy industry? Uh, well, this is one of the reasons. Uh, so this plot uh, shows uh, every day since 2012, and it shows a percentage of the UK energy uh, that was generated from burning coal. Uh, so we can see some very positive developments, in fact. And in, I don't know if you have been following the news. More recently, we have had some prolonged stretches of extremely low uh, fraction of coal on the UK grid, uh, in part due to good weather, uh, in part due to uh, sort of policies and politics and various shifts in the landscape. Uh, but that comes with its challenges, and I'll try to outline some of them very quickly. Uh, so the traditional energy grid, it basically has the supply uh, or the generation side. We have some big power plants. You turn them on. They run for months. They burn a lot of whatever it is they burn. Uh, there are some intermediaries, uh, there are some markets, and if you're a domestic uh, customer, if you're a household, you probably have heard of the big six. Uh, you may have had your energy delivered by E.ON or British Gas for decades, and the household is sort of, it just sits there for 20 years and consumes some energy year in, year out. Uh, now, things are changing. Things are changing across the spectrum. Uh, things are changing on the generation side. We now have far less predictable generation from renewables, they're weather dependent. Uh, we have much less centralized and more distributed generation. The solar plants tend to just be spread out in lots of little patches. Uh, we have changes on the domestic side. Customers are getting uh, smarter homes. They're getting uh, battery powered vehicles uh, that place new demands on the grid, but they're also installing their own generation, right? So, Octopus Energy, as a consumer-facing uh, retailer, we sit somewhere in the middle. Uh, now, of course, we love doing things better than the big six, and we love doing it with data and technology. Uh, and we have a lot of projects across the spectrum. Uh, but one of the key reasons why uh, we are in a position to do what I'm, I'll be talking about is quite simple. We know where our data is. And actually, it's surprising how many companies don't. Uh, so given that we know where our data is, uh, we can uh, make graphs like this, <laughs> right? Uh, we can make graphs like this. So here is a particular week uh, from uh, some months ago where there, was, uh, there were several days in green. You can see the green energy gener generation. This is, uh, what, 10 gigawatts uh, of wind on the grid. Uh, and uh, overlaid on top of the green line, which shows the wind generation, is the price signal. Uh, so this is, we are the only retailers that offer a fully dynamic price signal to our customers if they choose to. Uh, there are people who are mining Bitcoin when the price dips. Uh, it's an early adopter thing at the moment, but we can, we can do this, right? So we can uh, pass this price signal to the customer and the price signal can go negative. Now the price signal is a reflection of the imbalance between supply and demand and the markets and the grid's efforts to balance it out because electricity has to keep flowing. You can't just store it very easily, uh, right? Which is one of the challenges. And then we can look at our customers and we can look at the smart meter data that we have been uh, gathering over the last year and a half, maybe. And uh, we can do various things. We can see, we can plot all the customers who are on a fixed tariff uh, versus all the customers who are exposed to this dynamic pricing. And we can see a completely different consumption behavior. Now, this is something the national grid or many other companies do not see because they, do, they don't have this data, right? We can look at it bottom up. So we can see this massive change. The blue is more representative of what the industry thinks everyone looks like. But we know that each customer has a different consumption profile. And in fact, many of these people uh, have a massive spike at night because they know the price is cheaper. We can see when they're charging electric vehicles. And we can see that uh, 
now, of course, we have helped this a little bit by sending a few notifications and press releases because negative pricing, uh, while it's just another number, right, it does generate some headlines. Uh, so people suddenly charge about twice as many EVs uh, and, you know, they save a few pennies and we, we do genuinely pay them, I mean. Uh, so you have a unit rate, usually you pay, I don't know, 10p per kilowatt hour, right? Now the price on the grid, it fluctuates all the time depending on supply and demand. If there is a huge oversupply, it's really windy, uh, the market can uh, start pushing the price down, there is an auction happening, and basically that price can be pushed uh, negative where you get paid to take off the energy. Because it's too expensive to dump energy, it's very difficult. You can, you know, you can pump water uphill, you can do various things, but yeah, so, and we pass that on to, consumer, uh, or to consumers on this particular tariff. Okay, so this is the sort of data that we're dealing with, uh, and we can disaggregate it further, we can look at customer level, and then we start seeing this. Uh, now, um, we have uh, tens and tens of thousands of these time series, and one of the key challenges that will enable us, or already enables us to do better, to make better trading decisions, to make better hedging decisions, uh, but also feeding into work like uh, optimizing batteries for the day ahead uh, to better make use of these imbalances is being able to forecast um, this. Now, as you can imagine, it's quite noisy. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the sort of challenge that we are facing. Uh, by the way, in case anyone was looking at these IDs and thinking of the German tank problem and how many customers we actually have, it's actually quite public. We are very open about how many customers we have. Uh, so we have about 77,000 smart meters, and this is about 10% of our total customer base. Uh, so, and that red line, at some point, that red line was going up at such a slope that I was worried if we can scale quickly enough, but, you know, luckily it flattened off a little bit. Uh, so, um, the rest of the talk is less about energy and more about uh, sort of how we approach time series forecasting. And I think time series forecasting has a bit of a reputation uh, within the data science community and it's, uh, it's often considered difficult, it's often considered a separate field, and I think some of the main reasons is that there are so many approaches and this is compounded by the fact that uh, there are so many uh, approaches emerging from different communities, different topical communities, different fields of machine learning and mathematics. And this makes it, certainly for me when I started, it made it very difficult to know where to start. You're kind of torn between so many different approaches. Uh, so I'll try to demystify this a little bit uh, and of course bias it towards uh, how we do it, but without pretending this is the only way. Right, uh, so fundamentally what we're dealing with, like with any machine learning problem, we have some features and we have some targets. Uh, we are predicting a value, we want to know how much energy is this household going to need, you know, on this date, at this time, and then we can sit down and think about what our features are. But the first thing we need to decide, is it a regression problem? Yes. Basically, time series forecasting is a regression problem, and that kind of points you to the right half of scikit-learn. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and then you can ask yourself, what are the features? Uh, Obviously, time itself is a feature. Uh, now, Pandas has date time as a type, and lots of other libraries do. Uh, Scikit-learn does not like date time as an input type. So this is something we need to think about. Uh, but other than that, it's just a regression problem. Now, the final point that I'll get to in this talk is, uh, as you saw, the behavior is quite unpredictable. In our case, we expect to be inaccurate and I'll talk about what this means, so we should start worrying about predicting some probability distributions, which we do routinely in classification. We say this is a 70% likely to be a cat, but with regression we often predict a single number, so I'll talk about that. Uh, right, so I said we have the features and we have the target, and then people come and say, okay, but I read about all these AR models and ARIMA models and a gazillion other models. Uh, I mean, yes, and uh, the reality is you can always draw this sort of diagram where yt is the point you're trying to predict, and uh, so this is in the sort of loosely ap applied plate notation, uh, so for each time step you, uh, you just draw the arrows. What does it depend on? Well, in the simplest case it just depends on some features that themselves depend on time. Uh, in some more complicated autoregressive case, 
uh, the previous value is included with the features, right? Uh, so it may uh, not be computationally efficient to treat it in the same way as the other features, but ultimately that's what it is. Why depends on these, all of those features including previous values. Uh, sometimes we want to use uh, latent variable models, uh, which is something uh, the uh, sort of uh, PGM, the probabilistic graphical model community, the STAN community is very familiar with. Uh, so there we want to have some variables per consumer. So think of these squares as four loops, right? So the inner four loop is over time and the outer four loop is over customers or households. Uh, so we could have a latent variable per customer that somehow affects the outcome or even external features per customer rather than per time step. And we can draw these diagrams in any shape. Uh, now, another popular approach to autoregressive models is to first aggregate the previous data, right, using some form of encoder, and then we use that encoding as an input feature to the next step by mixing it with the other features. Uh, so it's a bit simplistic, but it really captures every possible time series forecasting model. Uh, so uh, by going too general, sort of maybe it doesn't really tell you how to implement it, right? So people look at these arrows and these models, and some people will say, uh, you know, we can use stand, we can use Bayesian modeling, other people will use their favorite technique, uh, right? Uh, now, we went down the deep learning route, uh, and one of the key reasons, and I think this is one of the main uh, sort of success stories of deep learning, I mean, it's very powerful in tasks that uh, were impossible before, but it scales extremely well. Uh, all the sort of uh, um, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, they don't scale nearly well enough, and remember, we have, uh, we, are, we have sort of approaching a billion data points, which I know sort of people from bigger companies probably will laugh at, uh, but we also have hundreds of thousands of time series that we forecast simultaneously, and we only expect this to grow. So we went down the deep learning route, and in fact, uh, what has been done recently with language modeling, with all the other approaches, it gives us a sort of dictionary. How do we translate terms from other fields into deep learning? Uh, so basically, uh, if you're familiar with sort of uh, AR models and you have exo and endo features, so you translate it into sort of features, as the exo features are features, obviously anything AR becomes an encoding of your time series, uh, latent variables uh, become embeddings, and I'll talk a lot about embeddings, uh, and then anything that has to do with sort of signal processing, filtering, smoothing, it can all be done with convolutional and uh, recurrent networks. Right, uh, so you know you pitch that to your colleagues, and if you work with guys like Jay, he says, "Sure, let's do it." Uh, so, uh, okay, so this is the sort of thing that we are looking to implement, right? Um, and we have the choice. We have a lot of choice. So we have uh, some daytime features. We have some household features which we can feed to an embedder. And I know there were several talks mentioning embeddings uh, sort of this weekend. And we can also look at the most recent raw data itself and we can pass it through an encoder. And uh, now this is where it gets tricky. Uh, those of you who tried forecasting stock prices with LSTMs or that like, uh, know it's actually very easy to get the next step ahead, seemingly very accurate and very hard to, do, to go beyond that. Uh, so I will not talk much about the encoders. Uh, I'll just say sort of when we do use it, uh, it's mostly not worth the computation time in terms of the improvements we get. Uh, and also we need to sort of pre-train it with an encoder decoder architecture, so I'll not go into that. Uh, in this talk. Okay, so let's start with the input features. Uh, now here I debated a little bit whether I should show code that uses uh, a library that no one else has, uh, so we just open sourced it. Uh, and maybe some people will find it useful. It basically allows us to feed data from Pandas data frame through scikit-learn pipelines and into Keras models with multiple inputs, multiple outputs, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but other than that, the code should be easily recognizable. Uh, we take the date time, we experiment it with different ways of encoding date time, uh, we generate some extra features like you know, day of week, day of year, fractional hour, this is a bit simplified, and then we encode those features in different ways. Uh, so and we end up with something like this, uh, so maybe for the time of day we, uh, we like using periodic features, so we use the sort of sine and cosine feature, which is a very useful trick by the way. Uh, for day of the week we use sort of one hot feature, so you can see is it Monday, is it Tuesday, is it Wednesday, or whatever, right? And then we have some seasonal features across the duration of the year, uh, and then we would add any external features from the weather and such like. Okay, so then we need to build a neural network that at the moment exists in Keras world, 
uh, but we would like to plummet to those features. Uh, now, this is where it gets uh, a bit interesting. So I showed you this diagram with multiple parts of the model, and we would like to be able to access the encoder. We would like to be access the embedder. We would like to be able to access the combined model in various scenarios. Uh, so the way we handle it, we define several sort of Keras models that share the computation graph, so they share the layers, potentially the inputs, uh, and then we just, you know, all we need is a dictionary of these shared models so we can address one or the other and call predict on each one of them. Uh, so uh, as you can see, embedding, uh, there is an embedding layer in Keras. Uh, who here uses Keras? Actually, most people, yeah. So this should be very familiar, right? This is a very simple model. So we take the embedding, we take the external features, concatenate, feed it to some dense layers. Actually, I don't know how many, oh, I left one dense layer here. Yeah, okay, so a, bit, a few more layers, but that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, uh, it looks like this, right? Now, because we defined it as a dictionary here with some convenience methods, uh, we can feed in just the household ID and get out the embedding by just calling this model, dot predict on this model, or we can feed it both inputs and get a sort of pr overall prediction. We can compile each submodel and so on. Uh, right, then we do the plumbing. Uh, so we take those feature uh, pre-processing pipelines. Uh, it could be daytime pipelines, encoders, it could be anything. And we just say which inputs of which model. So our embedder model has one input and it has an output, but we don't really care. And then for the forecaster model, it has two inputs in this case and one output. And uh, I feel like most data scientists have written some kind of pandas column selector, pandas value selector transformer, uh, this sort of thing. And scikit-learn is actually getting better, but I feel it's not quite there yet in terms of feeding pandas directly into models. Uh, right, uh, and then we end up with this object. Uh, so this object that we use, it allows us to fit the original model, so it provides a familiar API, uh, and it has the extra keyword argument, which is just the model name, right? Uh, but the details are not important. Basically, we can train the full model, including the embedder, on the whole data set. We can batch it the way we want. Uh, we can use batch generators, which is particularly important when we do actual sequence encoding, uh, because uh, we can't pre-generate all the batches in memory, because one time series can yield any number of overlapping windows. Uh, so we do it uh, sort of online during the training. Uh, we can then do things like we can freeze uh, everything except the embedder, which is particularly useful if we train a big model, but then you add an extra customer. Right, and this is where embeddings have a huge advantage of, uh, uh, let's say, one-hot encoding, right? Uh, we don't really want to encode 100,000 customers one-hot, uh, but um, assigning a fixed-length embedding gives us a re representation of the customers that's easy to train, easy to update, and actually gives us some neat features further down the line that we can use in other models. Uh, now, by having this encapsulated model, so this is a bit on the production side, uh, we, uh, the, one of the reasons to encapsulate all of this in a single model object that includes the feature pre-processing, that includes the sort of simple dot .fit, dot .predict API, is to make it easier to run in production. And the main reason for that is because we have a very small team and we have no one to hand it off to. Uh, so uh, we can't just say, okay, here's a notebook. Um, so having this uh, model that has a dot .fit, dot .predict, um, we put it, you know, we put our framework and all the dependencies in a Docker container and we can run it, we can schedule it, uh, we can uh, run it all uh, through, a, uh, we can run it monthly, we can run it weekly, uh, and we can do different updating. So here I'm showing how new data is coming in, new customers are getting added, right? Uh, and every time we do updating, we only update the final layers in this case. Uh, well, this is sort of representative of just the embedding part. Uh, so we update the model, these embeddings themselves will evolve over time, and maybe someone come up, comes up with a new model, we deploy a new model, and it starts running every month. It does a big training run every day. We use it to generate some forecasts for traders. Okay, uh, so we do all that. Uh, so what does it look like? Uh, well, it doesn't look too great. Uh, you can hopefully see that those customers are randomly selected, uh, except this one, this is our CTO. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Uh, those models are kind of uh, capturing the behavior, but it's actually very difficult to see how well they're doing. Now, of course, we're doing cross-validation and we're looking at error metrics, uh, which gives us sort of a good indication of how the models compare to each other. Uh, but you can probably anticipate that if one of these spikes is someone putting on a kettle, it's very difficult to predict, and we are not claiming to be able to do that. 
Uh, it looks a lot better if we aggregate it, if we aggregate the large set of customers, as you would expect. And a lot of the time for trading decisions, this is what we care about. Um, and if we look at the individual customers and we do some aggregation, what the model clearly does learn if we aggregate it enough, it learns that this customer mostly has a higher consumption in the evening hours, this customer has a higher consumption in the morning hours, and this customer has a higher consumption at night time uh, compared to the other customers. So the model, uh, and then you can start tuning your hyperparameters and comparing different models and all that. Uh, so we can look at the embedding space. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if it creates the illusion of being three-dimensional, uh, but it is sort of three-dimensional. Uh, different people see different things in this space if they stare at it for long enough. Uh, now, I, you can color it by different things. You can color it by uh, the sort of total consumption. Um, yeah. Uh, you can color it by various <laughs> ratios. Uh, you can color it. Uh, but the important thing is it groups similar customers in the similar area of the latent space, which is something that has been demonstrated with, vector, uh, with word vectors time and time again. We obviously didn't invent this uh, approach, uh, but it's very useful and works so well in so many areas. Uh, right, and we can, uh, we can then do nearest neighbor in this space if we want some clustering or categories of customers. Right, now how do we deal with the errors? Uh, and you may notice I'm noticing that I'm running out of time very soon. Uh, so we look at the errors and we find that our errors themselves are actually quite badly behaved. Uh, they are not Gaussian. They sometimes have sort of uh, double peaks. Uh, they have fat tails, uh, horrible. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Well, the first thing we can ask ourselves, can we actually improve the model? Is it the model that is to blame? There is no definitive answer. We can try, we can add more features, we can do cross-validation and hyperparameter optimization. But in practice, there is no way of knowing if you've exhausted your feature space and if what is remaining is a real underlying stochasticity, right? Uh, we're not talking about sort of uh, hidden variables in quantum mechanics here. There is no way of knowing. Uh, now, um, however, we would like to have a view of these errors, not least because this feeds into trading decisions and trading decisions mean money and, you know, someone will come and complain about poor forecasts eventually. Uh, so. What do we do about it? Well, first we need to recall why we used, uh, what we optimized in the first place. We optimized the mean squared error uh, because it's what you do for regression, because that's what every single regressor does. Why do we optimize mean squared error? Uh, well, we optimize mean squared error uh, because uh, we are assuming something about the underlying distribution. We are assuming that our underlying distribution is Gaussian. We are assuming even more. We are assuming that this sigma is constant. So we are assuming homoscedasticity of our data and we are only fitting this mean, we are fitting an estimate to the mean of this distribution. And then we can do the likelihood calculation and I'm not going to go through this, but if you do the maths, you're trying to maximize the likelihood of the parameters that you're estimating given the data. Um, we can implement, so Keras, when you do Keras um, loss equals MSE, it really constructs a computation graph that looks like this. It takes the features and feeds it through the prediction model. It takes the target, it computes the loss, and then sort of back propagates through here, right? Except we never feed the target in explicitly, but we can. We can define our own loss function. Uh, what I've done here, I've abused Keras by passing it an identity loss function and then calculating the loss in an actual separate lambda layer. Uh, right, uh, there, there are actually examples, uh, so if, you, if you're not following all of this, there are examples online uh, that I'll share some links to. We can take it further. We don't need to say that sigma is constant. We can make sigma itself a parameter of the model, and this will allow us to capture the behavior where the errors are bigger at certain times of day or for certain input features. Uh, but this still leaves us with a Gaussian, right? Uh, so we'll skip that. Now, uh, there is a useful trick that was introduced uh, sort of by Bishop of the book, uh, of the textbook fame a while back, and uh, it doesn't seem to be used very much, uh, but you can approximate any arbitrary distribution, right, as a sum of several Gaussians. And it's, uh, if we output, instead of outputting a single mean and a sim single sigma, sigma, we output several of those and add them up, we can approximate any distribution. So you can approximate sort of distributions like this. You can approximate multi-valued distributions where you see you have sort of three components, three mixture components, and the color indicates the strength, the weight, and it sort of switches between 
the components. You have some switching behavior. You can basically do uh, Markov chains in continuous space. Uh, OK, uh, so we can do this in Keras, right? So again, uh, as long as your sigma at, as, as long as your sigmas are non-negative, your means are real valued, and your weights add up to one via softmax, you're good to go. So we can optimize that. Right, now in practice, training these models uh, can be a bit tricky. They do tend to get stuck a little bit. You have to be careful with your learning rate annealing, and again, uh, sort of, we don't want to go into too much detail. Uh, but at the end of the day, so here we fit it to that previous data that I showed before. And this is not a single customer, this is a port at portfolio level, right, where we actually usually care about the risk at portfolio level. Uh, so I've fitted a three component, uh, I think it was three component, it could be five, uh, it's just some components tend to converge to zero. So you end up, you have automatic selection in some sense of the number of uh, components. Uh, so here are the sort of individual sigmas of the different components. And actually, you can see this is Saturday, Sunday, where we have much higher variability. Uh, you have sort of individual means, and you can compute the aggregated uh, mean and standard deviation, but your distribution is no longer constrained to being Gaussian, which is very useful, and it allows you to model distributions with sort of a narrow central peak and wide tails at the same time, uh, or a distribution that's not symmetric. Uh, right, so we can use these models for sampling. Uh, and in fact, TensorFlow, it's amazing what you find in TensorFlow these days. Uh, you can do sampling directly in TensorFlow, where initially I sort of exported everything to NumPy, but yeah, we don't need to. Uh, so you can uh, construct random samples as part of your model. Uh, you can uh, then compare the distributions of the real data with the sampled data. Uh, and most importantly, you can do that all of this is, has some seasonality to it. So you are inevitably forced to aggregate over either a certain hour or a certain season, uh, but for each of those, your model gives you, assuming you trust your model, right? The, no one said that the model, that it removes all the if, uh, sort of uh, cross-validation requirements, uh, but you get a pretty good approximation. You get this multimodality of price, and this is where we're looking at the price that can go positive and negative on this sort of last-minute imbalance market. Um, and then uh, you can sample from that. Now, this is sampling one step ahead. Uh, sorry, th uh, this is um, sampling, right, from this distribution. And it looks wrong because a real portfolio doesn't behave like this jittery mess. Now, the reason it doesn't behave like this jittery mess is because it has some autocorrelation, which we haven't included, right? So let's include that. We include the previous time step as an extra feature. If we sample one step ahead, you can't quite see it on the screen, but the, uh, the variance goes down a lot once we condition it on the previous point as one of the input features, but then we can sample iteratively just like we do when we generate text. Uh, so we can generate one step at a time and we get these smooth curves that again, you can't see very well because of the resolution, uh, but uh, maybe I can make it bigger. No, that doesn't help at all. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm glad, I, uh, CSS is not my strong point. Uh, so uh, yeah, so you can sample realistic portfolio scenarios that are distributed in this high dimensional time series space that has as many dimensions as there are time steps, right? And you can sample from that space uh, using this one step ahead uh, sampling. Uh, and you can try to perturb it. You can say, oh, what if my portfolio suddenly consumes five times as much as it usually does? and it does tend to revert, it does, uh, the model does tell you, yeah, no, that's not gonna happen. Uh, and the model just reverts back to the more expected behavior. Uh, oops, sorry, sorry, I just, okay. So we, we can do this with price and volume separately, and we can plot one against the other, and it lo all looks fairly well. Uh, now, something that, uh, it, is anyone here in finance? Yeah, so, uh, I don't know, probably people uh, in finance are very concerned about long tails and correlations, and in particular sort of tail correlations. So if there is a point up here where our customers suddenly consume way more than we thought, and at the same time the price spikes, uh, you know, this is a huge exposure to us. Uh, and we haven't talked about correlations at all. Uh, and I'm not going to talk much about correlation, I'm just going to say that with, within the same framework, within TensorFlow, within Keras, we can compute things like quantiles, which means we can project, uh, we can take out the seasonality, we can take out the daily behavior, and we can 
plot each point in terms of the quantile within the uh, volume space and the quantile within the price space. So we map, we, once we have removed the seasonality, uh, we can basically uh, see if there is an accumulation of points in the top right corner. And this is specific months. Some months clearly are more exposed to these tails than others. So we can suddenly see those tails and these plots um, uh, show that we need to do something. We need to do some modeling uh, to account for the higher likelihood that the events at the far end of the price spectrum and at the far end of the volume uh, or consumption spectrum will co correlate. And of course, we don't want to leave TensorFlow. Uh, so we just implement another model uh, which has its own likelihood and uh, this class of models, this, uh, this is called a copula model, right? And then we end up with something like this uh, and it gets increasingly complicated, but actually it's not. As because TensorFlow allows you to construct an arbitrary graph and not just a stack of dense layers, it's perfectly suited for doing stuff like this. Uh, so you can, so here's uh, some volume sampling, volume mixture density network, uh, so there will be an output somewhere that has the, uh, the loss for fitting that part of the network. There will be an output for the likelihood loss for fitting the price part of the network. Uh, there is some other network doing the copula, uh, which is uh, taking outputs from these uh, samples, right? And there will be another model. Uh, so just uh, say, so this is not to tell you how to do copula modeling. Uh, this is more about practical uh, considerations when implementing these types of models, right? And the practical consideration is uh, make use of sort of predefined uh, layer stacks, uh, as many people have done sort of with ResNet and the like, and make use of this model sharing and sharing the computational graph between multiple models. Uh, and th so if you define several interconnected models, you can then call each one of them, and if you train one, the weights become immediately available to the other. And this is something that gives you a lot of power and a lot of control. Uh, so what are the key takeaways uh, from this talk? Uh, now, of course, I wanted to interest some people uh, in this energy space. It's a very exciting space. Lots of things are happening with new data becoming available. The market's changing in the way they operate. Uh, obviously, challenger brands like Octopus Energy eating into British gas and uh, the big six's customer base. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the first point is that time series aren't scary. Uh, forecasting time series is, uh, to a large extent, a simple regression problem. Uh, if you engineer your features right, you usually do not need to worry about LSTMs and the like. And in fact, I would argue that it should always be the first step. Uh, engineering date time features is something that is sort of discussed, but maybe there is no standard approach. You don't have a date time feature encoder in scikit-learn. Uh, but you do uh, in that GitHub repo that I'll link to. Uh, deep, learning, deep learning frameworks, uh, yes, we have several layers, which makes it a deep learning model, but the main power of the TensorFlow and Keras framework for us is that flexibility it gives us in constructing computational graphs. And uh, yes, we can do CNNs on time series, but this is not the main takeaway. The main takeaway is you can do layer sharing, you can train different parts of the model, and you're very flexible. Uh, the third point is really you can embed anything. Uh, so we've heard about embedding products, embedding users. In this case, we're embedding households and their energy consumption patterns. Uh, and the final point is, and this is again something that I find is neglected a lot when discussing regression, is the probabilistic aspect of it. Uh, when you do classification, you always have a softmax output with probabilities before you reduce it to a single label. Uh, with regression, uh, it's more difficult to do potentially, uh, or it's done less often, but in many cases like ours, the prediction itself is probabilistic. So when we're looking at the errors, when we're looking at the mean squared error, what we capture is not the fact that we haven't built a good enough model, but the fact that we are trying to predict something that is inherently stochastic. And making this distinction for your specific problem, you may be more towards one end or towards the other end, and this will sort of inform where, whether this is useful to your problem. Uh, but for us, and especially in terms of quantifying risk, it is very useful. Uh, so there are some links, and the slides will be online. In fact, uh, actually, here's a link to the slides, but I'll post it on Slack. Um, uh, there is, uh, so you can, you can have a poke around this uh, framework that allows us to build these interconnected models and connect them to scikit-learn pipelines. Uh, there are some related projects that I haven't worked with personally, but they seem to be thinking in similar directions to what we do. 
uh, or maybe, okay, I shouldn't take too much credit. We are thinking in similar directions to how TensorFlow core devs think. Uh, and uh, there are some open data sets as well. Uh, so you can't have our smart meter data yet, uh, but there are uh, smart meter data sets uh, from research projects. Uh, there are data sets for wind and solar generation by site. And I think this is a great space. Uh, there is not a standard time series data set like MNIST or COCO or ImageNet, right? Uh, but there are many data sets out there that allow you to experiment, allow you to try different things. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's that. Uh, with me was uh, Constantine the Friendly Octopus, hiding up there as well. Uh, and if you use this email here, you can reach me. And if you use this link here, uh, shameless plug, I get 50 pounds. <laughs> and you get 50 pounds. And you get 100% green energy. And the 50 pounds that you don't get, we spend it on GPUs. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Hey, go great talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask: Do you, um, do you, how do you think about the amount of data uh, before you kind of start thinking about regression or deep learning? Uh, is that something that you take into account, or is it that you just have a threshold and after that point you just you can do whatever you like? It's uh, it's difficult. There were several factors here why we think deep learning is the way forward. Uh, so there was a great talk uh, about profit earlier yesterday maybe. Uh, profit is great. If you have a single time series, uh, profit is great. It does, uh, it basically it builds a hierarchical Bayesian model. Uh, it works well. Uh, the, you don't have the scalability issue. Uh, and also, if you don't have this linked behavior between multiple customers, right, uh, you don't benefit much from the embedding, from the transfer learning that it allows you to do. Uh, whereas in our case, uh, we want to be able to uh, have differentiable latent variables, which allow to do effectively transfer learning between customers and apply one customer seasonality implicitly to a customer who's only been with us for a month, right, and project ahead. Uh, but also, in terms of scalability, deep learning uh, predictions scale linearly uh, in the amount of data, or you scale horizontally. Uh, but training itself scales sublinearly because you just, you know, you would think you need to go through bit more and more data, and you do, but you tend to converge a bit faster. So it's actually sublinear, uh, which makes it super, super attractive to us uh, because we expect this amount of data to grow tenfold, hundredfold. All right, a few more. This is really great, thank you. And uh, on the note on, of the embeddings, do you retrain them periodically or you, do you update them? And then also have you looked at the temporal evolution and uh, of the embedding space things? Uh, yes, on both accounts. Uh, we uh, have, uh, so this is what I tried to indicate here, where the individual embed, schematically, admittedly, where an individual embedding starts somewhere and then as we retrain, it moves a little bit over time. Uh, yes, uh, we haven't done enough in that space uh, because you know, we have some uh, constraints. Uh, is they definitely evolve. At the moment, when we do redo the full model run, including all the dense layers on top, we lose the original embeddings. Uh, there is a very interesting paper uh, from what was called FaceNet, where they construct facial embeddings, and they talk actually in the appendix, they talk about how to update a model or implement a new model that is compatible with old embeddings. Uh, this is something we haven't done, but it's definitely possible. One final question, please. Somebody from the back, maybe. I might have missed this, but how do you do cross-validation in this setting? Okay, uh, so we do uh, temporal cross-validation. We, uh, you know, we train up to a certain date, and then we use sort of the window months or a certain fixed size window ahead of that for cross-validation. Uh, during development, we were working with a much smaller data set, and we could do sort of threefold, fivefold. In practice, uh, I'm not going to pretend that we do five-fold cross-validation and everything because it does take a long time to train. Uh, but uh, on the plus side, 
uh, what we do, we run multiple models side by side, which includes training them monthly with cross-validation on a single split, and then a month later we get another split, and a month later we get another split, uh, and we can effectively look back over the past six months and see which of the models has been performing better. And we can on the fly simply tell the traders which model to query. Cool. Uh, one final, sorry, we're out of time for questions. Uh, one final um, round of applause for Eagle, please. Thank you.